Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 313, where we talk to Lynette Calfani Cox, the money coach, and to get her take on some of your big burning financial questions. Anybody who's seriously considering entrepreneurship should um, absolutely get their personal finances together as best they can first. They should map out what it's going to be like to potentially draw no salary or to have to spend and or heavily invest in the business for at least one year. And so I think a lot of times that go versus no go decision might be better um, determined based on answering the question, am I truly ready? Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen. And with me as always is my analytical co-host, Scott Trench. And it's great to be here with my insightful co-host, Mindy Jensen. Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I am excited to bring on Lynette Calfani Cox today. She is the money coach, a recognized personal finance expert, and we had a bunch of questions from our our Facebook group, and she's here to answer them today. Lynette Calfani Cox is the money coach. She's been talking about money for a very long time, first as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and CNBC and the Associated Press and a tiny little outfit called the Dow Jones Company. Maybe you've heard of what they they do. She's a recognized expert on money and personal finance. She's written 15 books on our favorite subject, including the New York Times bestseller, Zero Debt, The Ultimate Guide to Financial Freedom. Lynette Calfani Cox, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Like I told you guys, I was looking forward to this conversation. I'm so excited to talk to you, The Money Coach. You have a website called Ask The Money Coach, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. We reached out to our Facebook group and we said, hey, we've got The Money Coach coming on the show. What do you want to know? And they wanted to know a lot. The first question they wanted to know about has to do with debt. Since you just wrote a book called Zero Debt, let's talk about debt. We frequently talk to people who have some debt, but they also want to start investing. So what do you say they should do? Should they start investing first or should they start paying down debt first? And sister question, could they do it both at the same time? So I actually think you absolutely have to do both simultaneously. A lot of folks consider it kind of like an either or proposition, and that's really the wrong way to look at getting ahead financially. Let's be honest, Americans are up to their eyeballs in debt. Student loan debt, credit card debt, big mortgages. Um, some people have personal loans, um, business loans, etc. So if you were going to just wait to invest until you paid off all your debt, you might not ever get around to investing. So it's just like people who ask me, should I save first or pay off my debt? Should I invest first or pay off my debt? You actually should do both simultaneously. It's in your long-term best interest. You want to give yourself that running start that investing early provides in terms of compounded interest over time. And of course, you want to knock out those high rate credit obligations, the stuff that might be say 16% or so, if you have credit card debt that's lingering, but chip away at it, do yourself a favor, prioritize based on what's most important to you. If growth is most important to you, for example, you might think about doing a little more on the investing side, but split some of those dollars, knock out debt, do it regularly, and invest. How, how, how do you think about that prioritization? Um, are there certain things you'd knock out first, like HSA or 401k match or these other types of things? How do, how do interest rates play into that? What are, what are the nuances for you in a situation where someone has debts and wants to invest? So on the debt elimination front, I really tell people to kind of tackle their area of pain first and what bothers them first. Generally speaking, I like to see people get rid of the high rate consumer debt the sort of quote unquote bad debt, the stuff like credit cards, as opposed to say student loans, which, you know, we can argue about whether it's a good or bad debt. And I actually think that all forms of debt can be bad debt or can become bad debt if they're either excessive or if you don't have a plan for how to pay them off. So sometimes, of course, folks will say mortgages are good debt because you can leverage it and you can, you know, build wealth from it. Student loan debt is, is a form of good debt because you can boost your earnings potential 
potentially increase your your uh, ability to generate a higher income over time. But you know, credit card debt or that auto loan you might get as soon as you drive that vehicle off the lot, it's depreciating in value, right? So in terms of prioritizing the debt elimination, I would go after the credit card debt first, and then things like auto loans, and then things like uh, student loan debt, and lastly, mortgages for folks who want to be debt-free and just either buy in cash or if they're heading into retirement and they don't want any mortgages. Then in terms of the investing side of it, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a pretty big question about, you know, what people are going to be prioritizing. Obviously, you're going to be looking at things like your risk tolerance, your goals, your investment time horizon, and what it is that you're actually investing for, right? So some people are saying, oh my God, I've got a five-year-old, 13 years from now, all of what I'm doing is focused on making sure that, you know, she's going to be good for college, you know, in, in 13 more years. Some people are totally trying to Um, fire out. They're trying to, you know, retire early and they're trying to invest as aggressively as they can so they can check out of the workforce. So it it is, of course, a lot of it is dependent upon what your specific goals are. But again, don't, you know, uh, be uh, reluctant to kind of split it a little bit there and to say, okay, I only have X amount because none of us have an unlimited source of funds. Whatever the number is for you, and let's just use a round number. Let's say you have $1,000 a month to kind of work with. You might say, "Uh, it's really super important for me to be debt free. I don't want to owe anybody anything. So, you know, maybe you skew towards paying $600 or $700 out of that thousand towards debt elimination. And then you put three or 400 towards investing as a whole. I like that. Come up with a plan. I think that is going to... Uh, be incredibly helpful going forward. You can't just willy nilly yourself to wealth. You you have to have a plan in order to be able to move forward. Otherwise, you will just willy nilly yourself. And I don't think anybody ever willy nilly themselves to wealth. Okay, the next super hot topic in personal finance is I bonds. I don't know if you know this, but as of today, they pay nine point six two percent, which sounds fantastic. Ooh, I love a good nine point six two percent super safe return. But I think people don't understand all the uh, rules around I bonds. So let's talk about those for a minute. Um, what are your thoughts on the I bond and and uh, what are let's let's just make sure that everybody knows all the rules involved in the I bonds. Sure. So, uh, first off, obviously, anybody who's a saver uh, is thinking about yield and about ways to get more return on their cash. And you know, you go to a typical bank, even you know, um, digital banks and others. Um, most times, people are getting you know under one percent. So the fact that you could get at least through right now, through October 2022, 9.62% by buying these I-bonds is hugely attractive, right? So first off, the first rule is the cap or the limit on how much an individual or an entity can buy, and that's $10,000. So um, if you're married, you can buy $10,000 individually though, and your spouse can buy $10,000 worth of I-bonds as well. Um, you have to keep the money uh, in there. You can't touch it for one year. And then later on, when you're actually trying to cash out, um, if you pull your money out early, you'll have to pay about three months worth of interest based on um, you know, kind of prevailing rates at the time for if you pull the money out early. So that, there's a little penalty involved on the back end if you stop early. But honestly, I think it's kind of negligible in the scheme of things. Um, but one thing I really want to emphasize to the audience, because a lot of people go, OK, well, yeah, it's just ten thousand dollars. But think about all the ways in which you can purchase I bonds and make that $10,000 go up dramatically. So as I mentioned, your spouse can also buy $10,000 worth of I bonds, 
But if you have a business, a business can also buy $10,000 worth of I bonds. If you have a trust, and I know a lot of your audience members do, they may have um, an LLC or a, a trust uh, in, in various forms, either related to their real estate holdings or their personal um, assets, etc. The trust can also buy I bonds as well. So just kind of think about all of the entities that you might have or have access to where you can be able to shovel a little bit of cash in there and get that really super safe, juicy return. And, you know, I love something that's protected by the, you know, full faith and credit of the U.S. government. <laughs> that's, you know, that we can, despite everything that goes on in Washington, that we can feel pretty good about that, you know, uh, we're not going to, there's not going to be a default on it. So, so I, I love I bonds. You just said two things that I didn't know about before. You said I can buy and I knew that. And you said my spouse can buy and I knew that too. So that's $20,000. You said my business can buy. So that's $30,000 and my trust can buy. So that's $40,000 in I bonds that I could, that I and my husband could buy together. That's a lot more attractive than, and I, I feel like such an awful person for saying than just the $10,000. It isn't just $10,000. It is $10,000, but it's, you know, I don't like it. I don't like my funds being tied up for a whole year, but $40,000 growing at 9% interest is a lot more attractive. I could, you know, if, if there's going to be a bigger payout, tying it up for a year is, is, I know it sounds counterproductive, but in my mind it works. No, it's, 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 it's exactly how it should be because think about it. The longer out you go, the more you need to be compensated for tying that money up or for the risk that you're taking and the opportunity cost that's involved because you could be doing something else with that money. So that's, and especially now, of course, if you're looking at what's happening in the stock market, <laughs> it's like, woo. Kind of getting, you know, almost a guaranteed, almost 10% over the next, you know, almost a year. That's that's a pretty attractive um, return on your money. That's for sure. Yes, I'm not getting that in the stock market right now. Does the return, is the return guaranteed? I'm going to get that for the next year. Or can it change if the CPI changes in six months from now? So, yeah, they do. It does change. So that's why, like right now, the um, current 9.62% rate is in effect through October 2022. Great. So I'm I'm going to earn uh, I'm going to earn a 9. Point, what is it 62% through October on 6 months and then it will change again. It could go down um, or it could go up. CPI continues to to remain really high. And obviously, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, but I mean, geez, look at how much inflation has been raging. We're seeing inflation at pretty much 40-year um, highs, right? And so I don't, I don't know, if, you know, too many people who are saying that, oh, you know, we're going to go like totally the opposite direction <laughs> and see like, you know, this, this, this huge drop in this accelerated pricing that's been, you know, in so many areas of, of, of everything, the price of everything is going up. Um, homes, you know, cars, food, oil, just you name it. So I think when we start to look at CPI and some of these other measures, like, you know, they're going to, things absolutely change, but I feel like this is going to be an area where you're going to get juicy, healthy returns for some time to come. Uh, one of the, one of the topics that we've been noodling on lately has been this concept of the perfect portfolio. Like what is the perfect portfolio for someone? And it depends on your goals and that kind of stuff, but let's, let's, um, create a fictional scenario and say, if you're starting from scratch and you're handed 1.5 million, how would you design that portfolio and why would you design it that way? So, I mean, I hate to sound like a financial advisor or a CFP because I'm not, I'm neither, <laughs> you know, I'm a financial educator, but probably they've indoctrinated me for so long for, for so many, for two plus decades. And I'm, 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 I'm probably echoing some of the sentiment here, but it depends. I mean, <laughs> um, so who are we talking about? Are we talking about a Gen Xer like myself? Are we talking about somebody who's a baby boomer? Are we talking about a millennial who's, you know, 30 years old? Then you know that portfolio. Okay, let's create, the let's create a persona. Let's there we create, go. Uh, Thank you. Bradley. Help, help me out here, Scott. <laughs> Bradley's thirty-five. He's single. Um, he uh, 
he, he wants to become financially free. He makes about $110,000 a year, spends about $45,000 a year, would like to be kind of be financially independent, um, and thinks that 1.5 million might just get him over that, that barrier. How does he invest it for early retirement? Um, from that position. Okay, so uh, that's great. You said his name is Bradley. That's our our fictional. Bradley. Yep. Bradley is our fictional. Okay, Bradley. Uh, I can work with Bradley. That that's a that's a great one. So, wow, Bradley's got a lot of advantages. First of all, no kids. Okay, so, <laughs> um, and uh, making one hundred ten thousand dollars a year, it, you know, is good given you know nationally U.S. household income about sixty thousand or so. Um, and him wanting to target early retirement, let's say 50, 55, um, ish years old. No, no. He wants to retire right now. Uh, well, early, my geez. How, uh, okay. Let me reframe here. Let me, I'm sorry. The, the Gen Xer in me came out and, and, you know, I forgot, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to retire like yesterday. So yeah. So 15 years is like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? That's like way too long. Um, so, uh, just again, just to be clear, are you saying that he actually has amassed and has uh, an asset base of 1.5 million? How do we con- how do we construct it? He's got 1.5 million after tax sitting there in the bank account. Needs to be allocated for a portfolio that will sustain financial freedom. Okay. So, all right. So you look at um, you know things like what his withdrawal rates might be and what his some of his spending. You said he's going to be spending about 40 something thousand dollars a year. So he can very easily and safely uh, withdraw 4% and cover that and and not have a not have a problem at all. Um, I tend to since he's quite young, I tend to go heavy um, on stocks on uh, on the investing side, as well as if he had an appetite for it, for real estate. I'm certainly super bullish on real estate. And I know, of course, a lot of your audience is as well. Um, I won't say my age. Let's just let the audience, you know, pretend they, you know, pretend I'm a millennial, let's say. Pretend I'm 30, I'm 35. But I think if you kind of flipped Bradley's age, then you'd know what my real age is. Let's just say that. (laughs) Okay. So, um, but, um, my husband and I own, you know, and invest in real estate. We have seven properties. Um, we're more bullish on real estate, frankly, than we are on the stock market. However, I, I, I actually do think that a nice split for somebody who's, you know, 35 ish would be probably having about, um, you know, 40 to 50% of their, um, assets in the stock market in either mutual funds or ETFs, um, exchange traded funds. Um, and I would be looking more in the growth category for him. Uh, you can, you know, kind of round it out and look at, at value plays as well, but because he's young and potentially could live to be 90 or hundred years old, you, you absolutely want to make sure that he's getting good yield over time. And of course we know historically the stock market has, has returned about 10% on average every um, you know, every decade on an annualized basis. So I think that for a lot of 35 year olds, they might be like, yeah, 10%. That's, you know, let me, let me jump into my crypto. Let's start talking about some of these other things. So don't worry. I'm going to get there as well. Um, but I just wanted to say that if somebody did have an appetite for, um, property, I absolutely, um, think that, buying earlier is actually better. And I would still, even with, of course, rates being on the rise and unfortunately prices being on the rise as well, I would still tell somebody who's in their thirties to absolutely get into, into real estate, to pick their markets, to really think about, um, uh, using their capital in smart ways where they could have some rental properties that are going to be throwing off cash. So again, for us, ours is, you know, more like, um, 70, 75% in real estate. And that's just our own thing. But again, I'm just, you know, kind of talking on the fly here to you to tell what somebody might do. Honestly, um, on the fixed income side and then on alternative investments, whether that's like crypto, um, I, I'm actually quite bullish on cryptocurrencies. Um, I would stick, I would stay in the, what I consider to be 
a little more solid zone in terms of Bitcoin, Ether, and kind of stay away from some of the you know, altcoins, some of the more speculative plays. I totally recognize that a lot of 30-somethings are like, huh, that's where the money is. I want 2,000% returns and that kind of thing. Um, again, sorry, the, the, you know, the money coach in me, indoctrinated, as I mentioned, by the financial advisors are saying, you know, absolutely take a portion of your money and put it into that. But I would think probably, I think for a, a 35-year-old, 10%, you know, maybe even 15% if they wanted to be a little more aggressive, 20% in that space would be just fine. Um, so I don't even know where I am in terms of the math now. I said about 40% in equities. If you're going to do, you know, maybe 40% equally in, um, in property or in, you know, real estate, anywhere from 10%, 20% in, uh, say crypto or alternative investments. Again, he doesn't make $200,000. He's not a accredited investor or anything like that. The rules are changing around some of that stuff, but, um, you know, increasingly we're doing private equity and other stuff too. So, and I, I think that I'm like, I should have been doing this when I was, you know, earlier, <laughs> but, um, but I don't know. I don't know if that answered your question good enough, but no, I, I, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. I, I think it's just, it's just, it's just fun to hear people think through these, these portfolios. It sounds like 40 stocks, 40 real estate, 10 to 15 in crypto, maybe the rest in cash or alternatives. Is that kind of the, yeah, and I, I I would totally agree with a with a split like that. For 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 example, with that, I, I like that would be exactly what I would kind of be be thinking around that the real estate asset value. The question I always think about is like, okay, the real estate asset value. If I put you know you know five hundred into real estate, I'm really buying two million worth of real estate. So my portfolio is inherently overexposed to real estate because I'm leveraged against it most likely if I'm buying it. So always something to to kind of think about how that how that works out. But yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that would, that would throw off cash to give a lot of growth, um, some exposure to, to the other things. I'm personally not a big crypto guy, but that would, uh, but I think that a lot of folks, a lot of Bradleys are. Yeah. And more than Bradleys, I tell you, a lot of, a lot of Brianna's, a lot of, you know, Becky's, a lot of, a lot, a lot of folks are, I mean, increasingly yeah. across the spectrum, you know, um, I, I saw this thing and I think it was in the wall street journal and it was talking about among African American. And I, I, I want to say it was either millennials or, or Gen X. I, um, I can't even remember, but it was saying, you know, what do they feel for these African-American investors is, is the number one um, best thing to invest in. And it was crypto. And I was, and I was just like, part of me went, Ugh, you know, because I, I, I see that I, I know that first of all, it's, it's a complicated area and it's, you know, even though, again, I'm very bullish, I tell people, yes, you should invest in crypto. So it's not like I'm anti-crypto or, or anti-Bitcoin or anything like that. But I do recognize that there's a huge learning curve and you, and you have to um, do your homework and you have to, there's a lot to understand in, in that marketplace. And frankly, I think the main thing, this is the, the number one thing, is really, if you're not going to be trading and if you don't have, if you haven't literally taken a lot of time to learn a system to, to, you know, to actually trade and most people aren't and shouldn't be trading for, if they haven't, you know, learned from somebody, then I think you should just be in it for the long haul. And then you, you have to be weather, willing to weather all of this volatility. So if you, if, if the stock market feels like a, a, a roller coaster for you, Geez, you you spend a day and, and you know throw ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars into crypto and, and see how your stomach feels after that. <laughs> oh. you, have, you have to be prepared because it's it's a, it's a wild, wild ride. And believe me, I know because I'm in it. You know, so that made my whole stomach churn. Like I was on an actual roller coaster when you said Bradley that. Bradley can I... tolerate it though. Bradley can hang. He can you know. <laughs> Bradley has Bradley can have my share of crypto because I want none of it. But I am firmly in Gen X and I don't understand crypto. And I believe that you don't have to be in everything. So I would take your 20% crypto and split it 50-50 between real estate and stocks. And that's actually what I've done. I am 50-50 real estate and stocks right now. And that's what I feel comfortable when what what I wanted to highlight is what you just said. Do your research and crypto market is volatile and you have to be able to weather the storm. So if if the stock market feels super squidgy, you have no idea 
what squidgy feels like until you get into the crypto market. Just watch it for a week. Pretend you have $100,000 in there and watch what it does. It just goes like this up and down all the time. For those of you listening and not watching me, I'm just moving my hands. Yeah. And not only that, there's, you know, you don't have to just watch it. You can actually, you know, uh, trade in a simulator, right? So you can um, see what it feels like because it it does replicate that feeling. Um, You can use... You know, there's any number of, of trading simulators that are out there. Investopedia, I believe, has one. Um, uh, uh, trade and Travel, I Trade and Travel, which is a, a program you can, you know, do to, to learn how to trade stocks. But you first start off in the in the class by trading in a simulator, and then you can you can see like what that what that feeling is like because you absolutely have to learn how to manage your emotions. You know, um, one of my books, I, I wrote a book called Investing Success, uh, How to Conquer 30 Costly Mistakes and Multiply Your Wealth. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is not having a sell discipline, not knowing when to sell, under what circumstances, why, um, how to sell in a tax efficient manner, et cetera. And so for people who are just like, oh my God, this is down 30%, I'm out, you know, that's not the way to go, <laughs> you know. So um, you should kind of, you know, have a game plan going in. Absolutely do your homework. Um, and the last thing I'll say about crypto, and then I guess we can move on. Uh, again, uh, my suggestion to for a 35-year-old who I know, because I'm looking at the future of of where I, where I see mostly blockchain technology and the extent to which it's going to underpin um, the digital finance, uh, the digital economy. Um, that's part of what gives me much more confidence in, say, Bitcoin, not to mention the scarcity component and the, you know, only 21 uh, million uh, coins, et cetera, uh, et cetera. But overall, most financial advisors that are, you know, kind of, you know, tiptoeing over there and starting to embrace, not if not embrace, but maybe give a slight hug, <laughs> a slight hug to crypto um, or a passing kiss on the cheek. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But they're usually recommending anywhere from a 1% to about a 5% allocation. Most of them don't even go much above 5%. Um, I do think, again, that um, younger folks can be, you know, can afford to be a little more aggressive, but you just have to be willing to, to ride it out a little bit more. You have to, to stay in it longer and, and, and have a, a a bit of a longer time horizon. And if you look at the data, I mean, people just get in and out of positions so fast nowadays. They, they trade, they're essentially, you know, trading more than they're investing. Um, but for a whole host of reasons, obviously, um, I think the, the longer term outlook serves you best. Yeah, I like that you use the P word again, plan, have a plan. Okay, so part of my plan has been to save and save and save and save and save for retirement. And now my husband is retired and we need to start spending. But it's really hard to transition from your savings mindset to your spending mindset. And we don't need to spend, you know, now ooh, now we got to spend, spend, spend. But it's it's really hard to transition from that savings mindset to the spending mindset in retirement and in early retirement. So how can somebody switch that, flip that switch? So you can't flip a switch. Um, it, it, you really can't. I mean, um, listen, you spent a, a lifetime, practically, your, your husband has, um, working, amassing assets, being in the accumulation phase, and now you're in the, or he's, and you are, you know, presumably also able to put your hands on some of that money. <laughs> now you're in the withdrawal phase, right? And the reality is that so much of personal finance, of course, is personal. It's the psychological, it's the emotional, it's the stuff behind the financial actions or the numbers on a spreadsheet or on paper. And so I do think that there's transition time that's required to, it's like you have to allow your brain to catch up with the fact that it's okay for me to spend. And you know what? This was part of the plan. And you might just do little by little. Like some people were like, oh, we really didn't vacation much. 
or we didn't go out to eat or we never traveled um, to, you know, see the grandkids once or twice a year or whatever it is. Right. And so I think that baby steps are actually prudent because, you know, woe be unto the person who's like, woohoo, I can spend now, you know, and most people aren't going to kind of feel that way, but some actually do. They're like, ah, I'm retired. Okay. I'm going to hit this. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I always wanted to do. And that first year, two, three, they might have a serious burn rate. And then they might think, oh my goodness, I have to slow my roll a little bit here. So I think it's better to err on the side of caution and to, you know, maintain a little bit of a, of a conservative uh, mindset fiscally to just know that uh, I'm not going to deplete everything. I, I still have a long life ahead of me. I hope to live decades more um, and to do things incrementally and to start with categories and then to start with one or two things and then to build upon that, right? So um, I happen to be a money expert also for AARP. I've worked with them since 2010. They've been a client. And so I'm very familiar with this transitional phase and how hard it is for people to, to you, we've been hammering them to their head saying, save, 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 invest, invest, invest. Don't spend, don't spend. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, you can go out and spend. And it's like, well, wait, uh, Sometimes there's fear of risk, fear of loss, fear of depleting assets, fear of running out of your money, a whole host of things. But again, psychologically, the brain needs time to adjust. Um, I was sharing with you, Mindy, before we came on live that, um, and your audience may see me keep, you know, tugging at my uh, earbuds here, that, you know, since October, my husband and I have been on a massive uh, health and fitness journey. We've each lost over 60 pounds and <laughs> thank you very much. Congratulations. That's yeah. Fantastic. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so, but I cannot tell you how many things I do that I'm like, Oh, I can do that now. But my brain has had to catch up with it to, to like literally because I'd had a back injury before Everything that I did when I would sit down, when I would get in and out of the car and not a chair and in a bed, et cetera, I was compensating and moving my bodies in certain ways to not trigger a re-injury. But now I'm like, I can just move. I can just do it. I can just, but my brain had to catch up with that. And even to see myself the way that other people see me and say, oh my God, you've got so much weight and blah, blah, blah. It, so it's only just now, six, seven months in, starting to go like, oh, okay, yeah, I can tell my body to do something and it complies, you know? So I just draw that analogy to say that, again, we all have to, after you've been doing something for so many years a certain way, you got to give your mind, your emotional state time to catch up. And that's okay. Well, when I... um. I think a lot of people, when they get excited about financial independence or just personal finance in general, they kind of go down this rabbit hole and get really excited about it, maybe read a lot about it, maybe obsess over a little bit, um, and want to share that with other people. Um, and sometimes, you know, I found that can be very annoying. I can be the one annoying other people about that, um, with that. What is kind of a healthy way to make others in your life aware of, um, financial dependence or good money habits or whatever without stepping on the toes of friends, family, relatives, and especially with like children, high schoolers or college students um, as they're getting ready to kind of enter the workforce? Well, that's a great question. And I have, you know, kids in that in that area as well. So um, let's start with the second half, the dealing with the kids, because I happen to have a, uh, a recent college graduate. Um, she graduated several, a couple of years ago. She's 24. I have a current college student. He's 22. He's a senior in Raleigh at uh, North Carolina State University, graduates this year. And then I have a 16-year-old who's finishing up 10th grade. And so she's a college-bound teen. So needless to say, I have college on the brain, right? Um, but so, you know, my kids, you know, they've, they've grown up hearing their mom talk about money all the time, et cetera, right? I think that for um, young people, part of it is about making it fun, relatable, engaging, and not something that just automatically feels like a chore. Um, so my kids absolutely know, like we emphasize 
sort of like five core values. First, that money is earned, that you got to work for it. This is, yeah, mom and dad might have money, but you have to get your hustle on too. You got to work, you know? So first you earn money. You, you They will inherit money, but we're, we're teaching them that the way that you um, accumulate your own wealth is not, you don't inherit it. You don't marry into it. You don't get a sugar daddy or whatever. I don't know, but you work hard to get it. And then after that, there's only four things you can do with money. You can save it, spend it, invest it, or donate it. And so again, they've grown up hearing that mantra and knowing that, but, um, we try to make it fun also for them. So like my son, for example, he actually, the 22 year old, he actually is into cryptocurrencies and and trading. So I'll talk to him about the stuff that is exciting for him. Um, obviously there's, you know, certain levels of gamification that, um, are, uh, done to, you know, whether they're kind of stock market games, or I mentioned simulators or things of that nature. The, the, the goal though, is to have kind of like less preaching about it and more just engagement in real life stuff. So for, for if, if my daughter who does have a debit card, the 16 year old now, so if she's talking to us about wanting to go shopping or make spending choices, etc., I am going to remind her about, oh, you know, how, you know, how much have you saved and what have you put aside and what do, what are you donating to church? I'm going to have that conversation, but I am also going to say, oh, those, those, those are some cute jeans. That that's great. Um, do you want to go to the mall or do you want to go to, you know, buy it online and save some money? So I'm not like stopping her fun and I'm still trying to convey the lessons, but I am trying to hopefully impart values like, oh, we comparison shop for ours, right? We don't just buy something because it has a label on it or whatever. So I don't know. In a nutshell, I guess for young people, I would emphasize making it fun, making it tangible, making it relatable. And you can even do things like I'm a person, I write about like celebrities and money and stuff like that. And I'll just talk about lessons and like what we can all learn from cele- celebrities or whatever. My daughter, who's like constantly on TikTok, she's like, she gets all her life information practically from TikTok. <laughs> um, you know, what are that? What were those four or sorry, five core values that you were mentioning earlier with money? One that money is earned. I love that. Can we hear the rest of those? Sure. And then after you, after you actually obtain money by earning it, working for it, you can only do four things. You can save it, you can spend okay. it, you can invest it and you can donate it or give it away. And so really everything you can possibly do with money falls under that you know, umbrella, those four things. So even if you're, you know, kind of, um, protecting your assets in some way, you're spending on say life insurance or you're um, creating a trust or you're putting a will in place, you're, you're paying an estate uh, attorney, for example, um, you're investing for growth. You're investing in yourself. You're investing in a business. You're investing in, as we've said, Um, equities or fixed income securities or property or crypto or anything else. So I, the reason I emphasize that is because as parents, honestly, if you really were to look at your behavior and think about like from when your children are kids on, what do kids see us doing? Um, Honestly, they see us making transactions. They see us spending. It's hard for a kid to see us saving. They don't just like see the money being electronically deposited into an account or whatever. So we have to be conscious in our efforts to show kids. If you're going to say you want your kids to donate, you you can say, listen, here's where we're, you know, diverting some of our money to help this organization, this group, this charity, this faith-based institution, for example. If you're going to talk about investing, you want it to be goal-based, of course, and you want to show your kid, oh, here, yeah, we're putting away this money for your college education. And, and again, we're, we're you know, having those conversations, for example, with Alexis, with our 16-year-old. So, so that was that question. And then the first part, remind me, Scott, because I just went on and on here. Well, I think you answered, you, you answered it. I, I, I was curious about how you um, teach others about, uh, about financial independence. Um, with that and, and especially kids. So I think, I think we, we completely covered that. And I was really, I, I really like those five core values. Money is earned and then 
after that, the other four values are you can spend, save it, spend it, invest it, or give it. Yep, away. that's right. That's absolutely right. And again, it, it, it kind of simplifies the whole thing around like the choices that we all have with money. And because I really emphasize that, and especially to adults, I mean, obviously we teach kids that, but a whole bunch of adults need to learn that lesson about saving, spending, investing, and donating. Because if you look at what so many people do, they get money in and like the vast majority of it, they're just saving it. So if you sit people down and you go, okay, well, how much, what percentage of your money are you investing? What percentage are you saving? What percentage are you giving away? If, again, if that's a core value of yours. And then they might be like, well, I just spend everything, you know? So, um, but once you kind of raise their consciousness about it and make them intentional with how they're allocating their dollars, then they're like, oh yeah, you know what? I'm going to really make sure I'm investing this amount from now on. I'm just going to allocate and put this to the side. I'm not saying it's a magic bullet when you just have a conversation with somebody, but preaching, no, that's not going to work. That's, I mean, the holier than thou or the, you know, flaunting stuff in their face, none of that is going to work. It's going to turn them off. What actually does work though, I think for a lot of adults is modeling good behavior, right? And kind of like, you know, as they say, living your best life, just like doing you. And then people are like, geez, how are you able to go on, you know, six weeks vacation? And, or how are you able to take off for the quarter or, or, or you know, or whatever it is that you're doing that they, they would be like, I would love to do that. And, you know, then you, then you're like, oh, well, you know, we, we really buckle down, you know, we save a lot on this side or, you know, cars aren't really important to us. You know, like I, I shared with my audience recently how um, my husband and I sold our second vehicle and people are like, oh my God, how could you live? How could you, you know, can you live off of one car? And I was like, yeah, you can. We did it. You know, it was a brand new car too. It was a, it was a, it was a 2020 vehicle, um, which we bought in December, 2019. We bought it brand new. And when I tell you guys, Mindy and Scott, this car had just a ridiculous amount of problems. It got hit twice. One just parked in front of our house. One uh, during the beginning of the, of the pandemic, my husband's coming back from the vet and just parked at a red light and a guy just bam, comes up from behind him and hit him. So, you know, the car was in the shop multiple times, two times, multiple months because of supply chain problems. And of course it was everything under warranty and we had insurance. So, but they were like, we don't have these parts. Sorry. So while the car was there for several months, we were like, Oh, we, we're getting by with just our sedan. We can, we, we're, it's just fine. So then they had a recall on the vehicle, a couple of things. So we were just like, this is this car cursed? This, let this car go. So we sold the car back. We wound up getting back like, you know, almost 10 grand. And cause you know, used car prices are through the roof right now. And so, but the point I was making is that when we told people about this, it made a lot of people go, oh, so I didn't go tell them, you know, you should, you should do this. Although actually I did. I went on headline news and I did a segment about it because they, they told me to come and talk about it. But, um, but in general, just to my friends and family and my, you know, audience on Facebook and whatnot, I was like, oh, hey, this is something that Earl and I did, blah, blah, blah. And then people were like, oh, wow. You know? So again, sometimes just like, modeling or just doing something and then people think like that's a good idea you know let me maybe i should try that too all right are we, are we have one last question here which is um and i think this is for some of the 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 folks that are really interested in in starting a business right and and so how do i make the decision to when i have to make a trade off right you, like i i paid off all my debt and do i invest in my 401k or my iras um, or something like that, or do I stash away cash to invest in start a business? How, how can I know that I'm getting ready to do that or that I, or how do I set myself up for that or know when, when to make that trade off if I have limited, limited resources there? So anybody starting a business, generally speaking, it is going to have limited resources. I mean, you know, some people mm -hmm. may be more fortunate than others and may have, you know, parents money or be able to have a, you know, a nice rich uncle or somebody to give them the start. But for the most part, everybody starting out is kind of bootstrapping. So you're, you're always going to be in that situation. Um, what I would say is anybody who's seriously considering entrepreneurship should um, absolutely get their personal finances 
together as best they can first. They should map out what it's going to be like to potentially draw no salary or to have to spend and or heavily invest in the business for at least one year. And so I think a lot of times that go versus no go decision might be better um, determined based on answering the question, am I truly ready? So it's just like, are you really ready for home ownership? I'm a huge proponent of, of home ownership. I'm a big advocate. Uh, you know, I have a book called Your First Home, The Smart Way to Get It and Keep It. And in another one of my books, Million, The Money Coach's Guide to Your First Million, I talk about pathways to building wealth. And of course, property accumulation is, is one of those pathways. So I'm totally bullish. But I absolutely say, don't buy a house until you're ready, until you're cash ready, until you have you know, proven yourself to be a good saver until you won't, you won't experience, you know, kind of payment shock if you're going from being a renter to an owner until, um, again, your credit is in, is intact, your DTI, your debt to income ratio is in alignment with what it should be. And yes, until you have a nice, um, cash reserve to deal with all of the unexpected and the stuff that's absolutely going to come after you close on that property. So by the same token, you should not just venture into entrepreneurship like, okay, I've always wanted to do this. Just let me go. Let me start it. I have the money. Let me start. No, that's an improper way. You're not giving yourself the best shot at success because we already know that access to capital, literally, that's the number one dilemma for you know entrepreneurs the, the whole country over. So what I would su suggest is absolutely do your homework. Absolutely leverage your skill set and your background and your network as well, depending on you know the type of business you want to start and whether or not it involves a product or service, etc. But really evaluate your readiness to succeed in entrepreneurship. And I think that that is probably one of the best things that people can do to figure out okay, maybe this is not the year for me to start a business. Maybe I would be better served pooling more resources into my retirement accounts or saving up money towards my uh, entrepreneurial goals and understanding that it's not like I'm going to launch here in 2022. It might be a 2023 call, but along the way, I'm doing homework. I'm, I'm monitoring um you know, my own personal credit. I'm a staff. I'm trying to get ready to be able to get business credit. And I'm doing things like benchmarking, you know, what my competitors are doing. So there you go. It's kind of like prepare yourself like be before you take that leap. Like, it sounds like if you want to get started in business, you need to develop a runway situation, preferably at least a year for your personal and business expenses, um, probably in cash um, or something highly liquid. Uh, and that may come at the expense of the retirement accounts or these other types of things. And in addition to that, while you're building towards that position, you need to invest 500 to 1,000 hours uh, learning about basics of business, reading books, networking, attending seminars, doing whatever you need to do to get ready to to feel you know, mentally ready as an entrepreneur as well. Is that a good way of kind of framing what you're saying? It, it absolutely is. And as a whole, another thing I would say to put a bow around this very quickly is, look, if you're an entrepreneur or you have an entrepreneurial mindset, if you're a property investor, you already are a risk taker. You're doing what you know most folks won't do. However, I believe in calculated risks, smart risks, judicious risks, not just bet the farm kind of risks. So that's the difference between somebody who's just gambling and, and just you know, playing the odds and just going to, you know, kind of go at it willy nilly versus somebody who's stacking the deck in their favor to make sure that they have all of the possible chances for success. Because we know the numbers in terms of how many businesses go out of, you know, go under uh, the first year, the first five years, et cetera. And you want to be in the, in the, in the latter category of businesses like mine, where, and I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I'm just saying 19 years and, and, and going, you know, um, where's the wood? Let me, let me knock on it here. <laughs> um, and it's because, you know, we've, we've, we've been very blessed. We've done a lot of things right along the way. We've made a ton of mistakes too, but we absolutely, um, take calculated risks and, and we don't bet the farm. I love it. 
Lynette, this has been a fantastic show. I really appreciate your time today. Can you tell us where we can find out more about you? Sure. So the best place is my free financial advice site, askthemoneycoach.com. I have a video-based learning platform as well called moneycoachuniversity.com. And then, of course, I'm all on social, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, etc., And everything is under The Money Coach or under my name, Lynette Kalfani cox Lynette, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for your time today, and we'll talk to you soon. Good. Take care, guys. Thank you. All right. That was Lynette Kalfani cox answering your burning questions. I hope you had as much fun as we did. Scott, what did you think? I thought it was great. It was a fun discussion. She has really insightful answers, and I thought it was a – I I learned a couple of things, especially my biggest tip of the day. I always learn something that I just had no idea about before, and it was the – the, the, the multiple ways to invest in I bonds between your personal name, your spouse's name, your business and, or your trust, or maybe multiple businesses or multiple trusts. So really interesting tidbit there, um, that perhaps some folks will be able to apply to their advantage. I'm definitely going to jump right into these I bonds and, uh, I bond education now because that makes it a lot more attractive. So yeah, you're right. I always learn a little bit from every single show and that was, this episode was no exception. All right, Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. From episode 313 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench and I am Mindy Jensen saying, take off your socks, Mr. Fox. (laughs) 